If you ask, do I know what I'm doing? No. <laughs> In most cases, no. What I've learned, at least, that being an entrepreneur is really hard. But I thought that, hell, if, if we don't do anything, we're anyway going to be in bankruptcy in a couple of months. There was a company that probably turned me, uh, turned me 20 years older, at least from the physical look and feel. It was really a learning curve. Hey, Tommy. How are you doing? How's the flying fin? Good. Actually, you're referring to flying fin. I presume you're referring to Paavo Nurmi, uh, the Olympic winner. Just sitting uh, in a building he built. Uh, it's a pretty, how should I say, musky weather uh, outside. Uh, rainy, cloudy, uh, sitting here in Helsinki. Uh, at Pitäjänmäki industrial area. So what are you doing there? Uh, our offices, Sniffy's offices are located here and um, we have new people who we just hired and uh, they are on onboarding phase. So I'm uh, helping to onboard our new employees. What kind of name is uh, Sniffy? Because I only know the Sniffer, and that's a TV series <laughs> from Ukraine. Yeah, that has nothing to do with that. Uh, that's more to do with uh, sniffing. So uh, there's actually a funny story. I, I met Risto Lähdesmäki, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Idean. Uh, we, we met in Silicon Valley and... I had a bit of a no, yeah, bit of a flu at that time, and I started my pitch to him uh, by by sniffing up my snore, uh, and he he started That's laughing immediately, and uh, and understood. He said later that he understood immediately what the uh, whole idea of of the brand Sniffy was. That it's sniffing data. Uh, but yeah, that was more an unlucky, unfortunate <laughs> mishappening. But but yeah, uh, I really got the idea that we should maybe be using that more in our pitches. But you are really into the marketing, so is that actually after the fact type of uh, justification for the name? You just made up a good story, or was that actually the real story behind the name? No, if we're really honest, so so the. The story behind the name was we started back in 2015 uh, with my co-founder or the other co-founder, Nico Naka, and, and we just decided one evening that today we need to come up with a name. And we there was plenty of different names, and at that time, Sniffy just sounded good to us. Uh, so there's, And the domain was free? Uh, not even the .com. We were so hung up to that that Sniffy is good name, so so we I think we started with .fi. Now nowadays it's Sniffy.io. Uh, every self-respecting startup uh, seems to have, uh, but I, I think someone still owns the .com. <laughs> so how's the pricing? That's what you're doing. And what do you have learned? Uh, how has it changed from the very beginning to the way you're now? Because you, you've you been growing, uh, I don't know, do you have 12, 15 people already? Yeah, something like that. Close to close to 20, if you take all, oh. all the uh, part-time, uh, part -time, not, not freelancers, students who help, help us as well. Uh, we started with uh, three people, uh, started working three years ago. Uh, so I was doing interim management. Nico was still in school, uh, uh, studying to become a, a medical doctor. So once he graduated, I ended up uh, one of my interim uh, interim projects. So we started. We were three people. Uh, yeah, it's been growing quite fast, uh, although maybe not as as fast as many of the uh, hot and bossy. Uh, startups, uh, but but still uh, significant growth for three years. And what we really do is pricing automation. So when we started, 
we actually started uh, the whole idea from search engine optimization. I thought that that would be a brilliant idea. Uh, and we did, did do uh, a, in a way, SaaS software <laughs> that could have helped you in the uh, search engine optimization. But we understood quite quickly, quite bluntly, that our solution would be just one of the uh, ones that are going to be dropped off fairly soon. Uh, but at that time, we noticed that we had a, a small technical innovation later on, uh, something we could have left at that. But yeah, we started studying more and more, and then we pivoted uh, a couple of times uh, to really find the edge. And now, now we are already on that, that there are companies that use our service uh, for automating their, uh, all of their pricing. So, so that's the vertical that we are destined to. Take. Are you doing for the retailers or what's the segment you focus on? Uh, retailers, but more importantly, e-commerce players. Because, because e-commerce as such, it's something today that the power is really on the consumer. It, it's about mobile phones. By 2022, this estimates that 73% uh, of all uh, shopping is done on mobile phones. And if you think of it, if, you've, if you think more clearly how you, for example, as a person, how you buy online, so you do compare. You spend a lot of time to compare. And, and there, there's a significant difference that earlier on when we only had brick and mortar stores, so you chose a retailer and then you chose the product and bought it. But now it's the other way around, that you actually choose first the product and then you start to uh, find out who of the e-commerce players, so the retailers in a way, uh, who is going to be the optimal, optimal one for you. So how can I do that more clever? Because you on the other side of the, you know, you're on the retailer's side. So, you know, tell me all the secrets. How can I find the best deals? And what should I do? Uh, no, it depends, of course. It depends a lot of, uh, on the verticals. But one of the critical aspects is to really understand the market pricing. Uh, there are, in many, in many industries, you have players who say, that they are always the cheapest. Uh, but it means that they've narrowed down uh, their market to few players that they all, always want to be the cheapest from. And then they fight with, I don't know, 20 cent uh, price drops. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make any difference. If you find it, you can still find the product cheaper in, uh, in Amazon, for example but they won't match it to that. So, so local players, they still uh, justify their own market. So it's better as a consumer to really understand uh, what are your options to buy from. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be local anymore. And I, uh, and I honestly mean that with mobile phones, the local has become global. If you're a small business owner or you doing e-commerce what, what have you learned you know from the pricing and and has the dynamic pricing we know from the airlines and, and these other industries is it coming to the regular t-shirt shop soon what do you can expect to some extent yes uh, we for example are already starting with our first like pilot customers to run our uh, enforced learning uh, algorithms to to really test what's the optimal price for a product uh, but dynamic as such as air, airlines um, hard to say for example for airlines it, it's a lot to do uh, first of all of course with the demand but at the same time also supply and there's huge systems that the whole uh, traveling Traveling agencies, airlines, they share uh, similar, similar uh, 
systems so that like booking systems and others so that kind of uh, sharing systems you don't have in other industries that well so for that sense maybe not uh, very similar but are t-shirt shops going to change their prices uh, dynamically against market prices so yes uh, they absolutely will uh, but how common it will be in let's say next 12 months so maybe the biggest one starts uh, but the smaller ones probably follow a bit late you mentioned this is your fifth company and, and you were already you know doing many many, many things before uh, but still you need to pivot mm. what, what, what's why is that happening don't you already know what you're doing no, if you ask, do I know what I'm doing? No. <laughs> In most cases, no. Uh, so what I've learned at least that being an entrepreneur is really hard uh, and could be very well could be that it's me. Uh, it's my skills, uh, uh, my concentration, my intellig intelligence. Uh, could be, but I, I do think that it's as hard for anyone else, uh, for, for everyone else, uh, and therefore it is something that you, I've always said that, I, let, let me give you an example. I have a lot of friends who say that they, they could, you know, they could start a company if they had a good idea. And then in most cases, I have to be blunt and tell them that, okay, then you're not going to start a business ever. Because the, the thing is that none of the ideas, no, okay, uh, let's, be, let's be honest. One, uh, that was the V in the water brand, that actually became in the end a water brand. Uh, but other businesses are such that you start, uh, and, and I feel that it's healthy that you start from somewhere, start testing, and then when you notice that, hey, people aren't interested in my idea, but they are actually interested in a couple of the sub-ideas, so then you start to pivot. You pivot a bit or you pivot a lot. Uh, it depends. Uh, in, in Sniffy's case, for example, we did uh, search engine optimization first, then we did market intelligence. It sounded sexy. It was really cool something that everyone thought that hey that's really cool to work on and blah blah but then in the end everyone wanted to try no one bought it simple as that and then when uh, i read again one consultancy report we had bought so there was different verticals that they uh, you know recommended to us and and also recommended against so I took one. I thought, okay, here's price monitoring. That sounds like a, a vertical we could do. That's something that's standardized, at least. There's a name and there's a price. Uh, and, and it was something that they explicitly recommended that we shouldn't go. But I thought that, hell, if, if we don't do anything, uh, we're anyway going to be in bankruptcy in a couple of months. So, so we did a pivot and in two months coded night and day, a new product. And by the time we got finished, we got our first customer who still uses our service. And, and I remember they paid 84 euros and 90 cents uh, a month. But I, I, I felt that, okay, someone actually bought the service. So now, now we are on to something. And then we started developing it with, with customers and every month we got more and more customers. And by the end, we already had, in six months, we had a, a five-figure uh, monthly recurring revenue. So I believe that many of the entrepreneurs who start businesses, they are uh, either too self-confident uh, on their idea, which is, of course, understandable, but you should... Be, be aware that 
your logic is your logic. You might be romantically in love with your own, own idea. That probably if you watch a bit as an outsider, you notice that mm, that's not maybe what people want to buy. So listening to customers and then being really, uh, you know, ready to make a change. I think that's uh, that's something that makes uh, entrepreneurs successful. I truly believe it. Uh, a few notions. Uh, one of them is that do you always do exactly the opposite what they recommend to do in those reports? And the other thing uh, is that um, when is the right time to do the pivot? Because, you know, it's like, okay, things are not working, but when it's like that you just have to, you know, double down and, and have some CISO crit and, and just, you know, keep on doing till it works. And, uh, or, you know, when is the time that you realize that, you know, this is a false game, this is not going anywhere. And it's a fine line and it's easier to see, you know, before or afterwards, but not, you know, when you're in the middle of it. That's a good question. Um, now, I've always somehow felt it in my stomach. It, it's a gut-wrenching feeling <laughs> that, that you somehow, you notice that mm, this isn't going anywhere, that that um, I can tell myself maybe a couple of weeks still uh, that it's not working. But for somehow, it, it's like in when you really get in, uh, or when you find someone that you're in love. So, so how do you explain that? Are you in love or not? You know it. And it's the same uh, with unsuccessful ideas. You pretty much know it. Uh, if you are open enough for yourself. It's it's more that if you're in denial that, uh, no, people aren't just getting what we do. Uh, but if you're honestly open to that, that mm, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not right in this, that it's better to change. So, so then you definitely feel it. But somehow uh, in this case, for example, so if, if, Everyone wants to try, and and no one's gonna buy, and then there's cash flow for two months. So that's probably a, a point where you need to pivot. The, it's simple as that. So have you learned to become better in that over time? Mm, yes, and and uh, that's maybe one of the things I think if uh, if someone would ask what you are good at. Uh, so I, I think I'm really good at doing things uh, or, or changing my plans. Uh, and that's that's often something that really even annoys people, uh, that they don't feel that I'm uh, in line uh, with my thoughts and plans. But the thing is that I, I believe that if I try five times, and I find the right answer. So it's better to do that quicker than you do it once with uh, su superior planning. Because the likelihood that in a very cha chaotic world, you could do planning that actually in the end works, uh, it's, more unlike, uh, it's more unlikely event than... Me, for example, uh, doing uh, very rapid tests with the market. I, I mean now tests, okay. Do something, show it to the customer and ask if they are going to buy. If no one's going to buy, then you know you aren't doing the right thing. So, so it, I, I personally think that it's better to do uh, things five times and quicker than someone do it for, for the one time and very well planned. You mentioned there was one thing uh, as, uh, from an idea that really worked for you, and that was a van. You, if I sort of paraphrase, you were selling tap water to the prestigious uh, places in the world. How did that came about? Yes. <laughs> there, was a, there was a company that probably turned me, uh, turned me 20 years older, uh, at least from the physical, uh, physical uh, look and feel. 
uh, it was really a learning curve. So, so when we started, uh, I had just sold one company uh, that I had, a marketing agency. Uh, and we were, at that time, we were moving to Australia with my, that time, uh, girlfriend. And, and we already got the visas. Uh, and at that time, uh, somehow I started talking with my friend uh, that we had both been in, uh, in different restaurants uh, and had ordered a bottle of wine. And we got plastic bottle uh, to the table, plastic bottle of water to the table. And both felt they was wrong in Finland. It, it was somehow uh, something that uh, didn't belong to that setting. And then we started, uh, started uh, developing the idea. A week later, we had a, a business going and... Luckily or not, uh, we built a brand that even uh, it became the house water of Harrods. Uh, and uh, it was, if I remember right, it was named one of, one of the most prestigious uh, water brands uh, by Forbes. Uh, we were uh, sponsoring and, should we say politely, an erotic uh, photo uh, exhibition in a, in a that kind of uh, upscale sex shop in London. Uh, we were the main water sponsor of Nightwish on their world tour. So we did a, a lot of different kinds of crazy ideas uh, and we never did leave to, uh, to Australia. So, yeah, that was really a, an interesting time uh, as such. Can you describe a bit how did you manage to get to the Harrods and, and you know, what are the steps from basically starting the company just with you and your, your friends and a laptop and, and then just having a premium product in the market? How did you pull that up? Oh, um... To be honest, I'm not even sure anymore. Uh, it, it feels like we tried everything. Uh, but if we sum it up, uh, so what we did, uh, we decided early on that everything we do must be something we as persons, uh, the founders, we find meaningful, fun, uh, and worth worth doing so so that was also the reason why we had different kinds of uh unbelievably uh how should i say obscure marketing ideas uh one one example for example we we were standing uh standing uh, outside uh hotel klaus k in finland and one of the uh, founders, uh, Antti Eklund, at that time, had painted uh, paintings. And the reason was that all the, because we got fame quite early on, uh, all the uh, telesales people called me and offered media space. <laughs> and I said to my uh, uh, founders that the only thing we had afforded uh, was to paint our own adverts and sell them to someone that we were at that uh, hard times. So, so that actually uh, sounded so funny, so meaningful, and and so somehow uh, odd to us that we started painting those pictures. And then we uh, talked to Mark Squark who was the general manager at Klaus K at that time. So I said to Mark that, hey, can you give me for free the hotel and maybe even, you know, offer champagne or something? If we do an exhibition of paintings here and we sell those paintings uh, for charity. And 
He loved the idea. I said immediately, yes, well, you can do that. And we painted pictures and we we took the prize because it was uh, in Helsinki City Center. There's a, there's a street called Boulevard and it's one of the most uh, expensive streets. So we took the one square meter prize of, of Boulevard uh, and took the same equation uh, of price to the paintings. So, so the uh, size of the painting was in exact proportion to the boulevard uh, square meter or the price of the square meter. And we sold to total strangers, uh, some friends as well, but we sold those paintings in one evening uh, for 10,000 euros for people visiting to coming to eat to the dinner to Klaus K and we gave uh, that sum to charity so so it was just a, uh, how we did it it's impossible to say but that really gives you the idea that we were just so passionate to do fun meaningful things that we all felt that was nice to do that it really started to pick up and, and at some stage, it turned into a brand. Then you were ramping up. Uh, you had uh, some uh, demand already piling up. And, and then you realized that this is not the software business. You need to actually do something in order to you know, provide what you already sold. What were the pain points there? Oh, oh. <laughs> so... Um... No, anyone who's doing, uh, who's done manufacturing, knows that nothing is easy. That's those are concrete things, and if you have a problem, it's never a small problem. It's it's simple as that. And and we started. We uh, that was probably the main one of the main uh, decisions we later on could have done differently. But we chose uh, to go with a bottling plant that was uh, up north, and it was fairly small. I mean, the people were genuine. Uh, they, they did everything they could uh, to, to make it happen. So there's nothing on that. But meaning that we could have done differently, that maybe going with a bit bigger choice, uh, we could have gone a bit further because we ended up uh, fixing a lot of uh, that kind of everyday problems instead of building a brand, building international sales channels and, and such. But uh, the biggest biggest hurdles was that um, the the equipment we used it was uh, it was too slow. So I think we produced something like 1,600 bottles an hour early on in the best case. And, and the real level we should have had was like 30,000 bottles an hour. So, so what we ended up doing is we, we went through with different bottling plants, all the breweries in Finland and, you know, called everyone. And by the end of it, uh, I managed to buy uh, some used uh, equipment from from a, a person I knew. Uh, it was a, a bigger bottling plant, so we bought it from their trash that they, they had already uh, promised for for someone who bought it for for like a, a pure iron or pure steel value. So so we bought like uh, different kinds of. Uh, equipment and build it uh, by ourselves and by the end of it uh, it really was fast but at that stage I already felt that uh, it had been such a struggle that uh, somehow uh, we just at that stage we we thought with uh, the investor that was uh, in the business that they wanted to go a different way so so they bought my my part of it but that was probably the hardest uh, building really the production and that's something that i've always said to everyone who starts anything concrete that that the production needs to be top top notch otherwise it won't fly at one point you were 
a bit eager to sell something and you didn't have it and, and then you needed to go to Germany and, and there was also some colorful happenings happening there, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, I remember it very well. Uh, it was before the launch, it was summer, was it two, 2007, yeah? And maybe May at that stage, it must have been May. Uh, I got a phone call from uh, a very well known business and political person, uh, Risto Eji Pentila, who was organizing a bis- European business leaders convention. And he was eager to buy uh, our water for that event. And at that stage, uh, I was so. I don't know, somehow eager, (laughs) so eager to sell the water that I really forgot even uh, what I was doing. So I actually sold him uh, a pallet of water. If I remember right, it was something like 600 bottles. Uh, And when I end the phone call, I noticed that it was the date of the actual convention was... Uh, up to a month before I even was promised to get the first empty bottles. And I became, of course, a bit panicky because I understood that there was a a bit of of a problem. So I called the uh, director who was uh, running uh, the Owens, Illinois factories in, uh, in Europe and and explain to him that we, we have a serious issue, that I've sold the uh, products already, and, and honestly, I'm getting the empty, empty bottles from you a month later. So is there anything we can do uh, to make it happen? And I, I still remember how, how really uh, angry uh, he was shouting to me and... <laughs> I, I really, he lost his temper totally. He, he said to me that, who do you think you are? And, and I probably tried to explain that I'm a small boy from Helsinki. But in the end, uh, he managed to, to somehow got it from, uh, if I remember right, I might be wrong at this stage, but it was either Pepsi or Coca-Cola, one of these big brands that had a, a, a production time slot. And they gave us, an hour before their shift started. So when they were heating up heating up the ovens, it was a glass bottle. So when they were heating up the ovens, they started producing uh, first hour bottles. And, and we got that 1,200 or something bottles. And I still remember uh, when... When we, because we we knew that there was no no other way to really uh, get in time uh, because it, it was roughly a week before the event. Uh, so so me and my uh, co-founder at that time we took a van and drove through uh, Sweden, no uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany because it, it was in uh, Germany the plant. Uh, and then took the bottles and started heading back immediately uh, to Helsinki. And I still remember there was a guy who didn't speak even uh, uh, any English, and he was uh, loading the van. So he raised first the one pallet, and I noticed my van's uh, springs were uh, lowering a bit. And then I was so greedy, I thought that, okay, hey, throw in the other pallet as well, because there was two pallets. He lifted in uh, in the van, and the, 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 the springs went totally bottom. And, and he jumped off from the uh, truck and, and came to me and said, no Helsinki, maybe Hanover. And I, I still remember my, my face was totally red, and I said to him, that, okay, take the other pallet away. And we left, left there immediately after that, drove back to Helsinki, and, and everything went well. Uh, but it was Friday evening, uh, and I got a phone call uh, that day when the European uh, Business Leaders Convention was starting. 
uh, on Saturday. So Friday evening, roughly around uh, half past five, I got a phone call that, hey, otherwise uh, very nice, uh, but your products aren't here. They should have been in a hotel in Helsinki. That they aren't here. And I was like, no, it should have been. Uh, so I actually what I had to do was to go and look it from uh, the logistics center that actually you, we used uh, to deliver the water. And, and it took me 45 minutes at that logistics center to find our pallet. And it was thrown in the trash. Whoops. It was thrown in the trash and it was about to be uh, dismantled. And, and I was asking them, what the hell is this doing here? So there was a pallet that all the uh, pallets have a small note where it's heading. So that's been ripped away and no one knew what the uh, products were. And, and I uh, managed to take some driver that was about to leave home. Uh, so, so I somehow, somehow maybe positively manipulated him to, to help me. And, and we drove those by eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, we had unloaded the pallet to the hotel. So that was a good example of how very well thought planning and execution didn't work at all. And by the end, we were so passionate that we managed to get those bottles there. And that was, I think that's been a guiding light in everything uh, as an entrepreneur I've done, that you really need to give all you can. And that's only, a, then you only have a possibility to succeed. A couple of weeks ago, I had a Ville Tolvanen a digitalist uh, in my show. And we were told that everybody should be the, uh, a lighthouse of their mission and really become a brand. Uh, but you just recently told me that it's so hard and, and you know, just, it's, it's easy to say that, but, you know, that the reality is something else. So what's your response to Ville or what's your take on the matter? Uh, no, let's first say that I truly appreciate Ville. There's nothing to it. Ville is actually my, actually my first ever customer. Uh, he was working for a company uh, and when I was a sales guy in, in the first, first job I, after graduation. So he was the first, first customer I ever had. Very, very interesting person with good, good ideas. But again, there's a bit of simply, uh, it's a bit simplistic view to say that, um, that you should be, of course, you should be the lighthouse. And Ville, if, if someone has shown how, how you should do it, there's nothing to it. Uh, but I've now done, what, five companies, uh, my own. Uh, and then as an interim manager, uh, also helped other companies to build their brands. And I have to admit that probably branding, marketing, it's one of the hardest things to really get spot on. And uh, one of the hardest things is to keep uh, pounding that message. Be passionate about what you do. As in, in Ville's case, he's passionate. <laughs> There's nothing to it. He's really passionate. But understanding that branding is all about meaning. And how do you build a cohesive understanding of how we are going to be meaningful for our customers, that takes time. That takes a huge amount of time. Uh, that takes also trials and errors. So to say that you should be to build brand out of yourself, of course, uh, it's easy to say, but then how do you do it? It is at least I've noticed that it's a, it's a years of work getting into the mind uh, of, of your customer and understanding what are the real things they appreciate and how you can simplify your message to the hilt so that they will understand and, and you 
can easily communicate it on all levels of your uh, organization. Because I, I truly believe that brand, when we talk about brand and branding, it has nothing to do with the visuals or marketing or, or it, it's about it's about everything we do as a company. Is this uh, something that we can stamp uh, the sniffy brand on it? So that's that's why I feel that really to get uh, good branding, it's it's harder. And I don't know. That's probably one of the areas we Finns haven't been that good earlier on. Uh, but I think we are improving. We understand how much work, how much cooperation inside the company branding needs uh, to really become an essential driver of the growth. So we've been very good in in creating good products, uh, but it's still a long way to build brands. What are the parts uh, in your life that you're struggling with? What are the sacrifices you have made? That was a question Hampus Jakobson mentioned in, in, in his interview. And, and he finds that very interesting question to ask from people who've been doing things and being successful as well. So uh, too often uh, that I've spent too much time uh, working. I think that's uh, it. When you work a lot, it's hard to understand where's the boundary of the next 20% of my uh, investment uh, will be useless because I'm too tired. Uh, so, so that's probably one thing that I've... Uh, I have been there for the family. I have been for for there for my uh, my spouse uh, and my loved ones. But I honestly think that uh, that's somewhere that you know worked hard. Uh, then also, I think that I've sacrificed on other fronts uh, that I haven't been looking after myself uh, as I should. So those are probably the two most critical ones. They doesn't, they don't sound that uh, sexy, but those could be if 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 you would continue and continue neglecting uh, your loved ones. So that's the most essential part uh, of your life. Uh, but then, what could be more important than your uh, well-being and and. W- I know that many entrepreneurs do take, uh, you know, burn burn the candle from the both ends. So I've done that a fair, fair share. And then I think uh, if you think from that point that what I've done, mm, maybe I also has sac- yeah, maybe I I have sacrificed also. Uh, some of my own time that I haven't give up in cer- cer- in certain things I should have give up earlier on. Uh, so I've I've in a way sacrificed unnecessary time uh, that I could have just said that okay, here's the line. This is we, this is a line we don't cross. So those are maybe the uh, biggest ones. Yes, I've. Lost money. Uh, I've done my fair share, but it, it, it has nothing to do with sacrifices. I think the sacrifice you only have one life, uh, and how well you live that. So, so yeah, that's the most most important thing. Uh, you mentioned as well that there's been some um, some diagnosed illness, which uh, has been uh, one of the defining factors in your life. Do you want to elaborate and tell what it is? Yeah, um, I've always been open, and I think this is something that I think we should be more open as a society for people's challenges uh, on different areas. So I, I've been diagnosed with ADHD uh, when I was around a bit more than thirty. So uh, to be to be honest, 
uh, my life before that was uh, truly a, a, a night between Tuesday and Sunday. So, so it really was quite chaotic. Uh, and I, I, I always thought that uh, I was a bit different than the others. There's nothing wrong with my cognitive capabilities. Uh, quite the contrary, I always felt that everything was easy as such. Uh, but then on the other hand, um, my concentration isn't as good as it could be uh, on a normal person. And people who know ADHD, uh, they also know that it could be a, a, a strong force uh, for many entrepreneurs, for example. So it's, uh, it is not, uh, let's say, it's not a diagnose or illness or, or that, that actually makes you somehow uh, absent-minded uh, or scatterbrained all the time. But it actually does two things. You are either very sharp, if you're very... Uh, if you get uh, interested on something, if you get uh, highly motivated, uh, excited, so your brain works like a, a race, it's like razor sharp. And then on the other hand, when the exciting thing ends, so so you you become very slow. <laughs> to to be honest, that. Uh, uh, with the <clears throat> with the surrounding with the loved loved ones, uh, so they often have a uh, hard time to understand when when I might be uh, working on a slow mode. Uh, so so it's a demanding for your surroundings, and there's a lot of people uh, that are actually uh, shamed uh, of being uh, of having ADHD. There's a lot of people who end up with uh, different kinds of uh, problems with alcohol or, or drugs or something. But it could be a driving force also. And I think the openness that, that we talk more openly on, on the matter, uh, it would be really uh, crucial that people tell that, hey, it is, it is what it is. You could be as clever as the next man. But you have that challenge, so it's very important to understand, to openly communicate it. So I met my uh, current spouse, who I love dearly. So, so I, uh, I told her immediately that this is, this is a, uh, how should I say, this is a feature in me. Uh, and, and it is something I, I need to work every day with. Uh, it, it also is something that needs to be taken uh, into consideration when, when I'm uh, running a company, that my strengths are uh, on, on things to be motivated. Uh, I might be really driving uh, change in the company. I might be really, uh, you know, all over the place, but in a positive way. But then, for example, we early on in Sniffy, we decided that, Oh, I felt personally even, I felt that I needed a right-hand person that would be uh, spot on, uh, always on the matter, and could hold uh, the operations in, in her, you know, in her hands. And we, we hired Subi. And that was uh, a conscious decision to see that, that the strengths that I had, uh, the company could utilize very well being very creative, being uh, interested in people, being uh, a driving force, uh, always with new ideas. But then it could be that the, uh, a little less exciting tasks would be something that, you know, no one does. And what's most important in a company? It's that it goes like a train. So after we hired Subi, we noticed quite quickly that our company also started to do that kind of steady growth, uh, meaning that our current uh, customer base started to uh, be more 
happy, more persistent uh, on using our service, and there was less and less churn all the time. And also then I had the time to concentrate more on building uh, the product, building the sales, building the marketing. Uh, and now we are picking up also on that front, getting new businesses also. But in a SaaS business that we are currently working, the main idea is to keep your current customers happy and keep them growing and add on few uh, few new ones all the time. So, so that's... That's something that I really encourage that if, if people have that kind of challenges, so all of these challenges, they have negatives uh, or they have pros and they have cons. And in my case, I've been fairly open in all of the uh, workplaces I've been or, or with any relationship that I tell quite bluntly uh, that this is what it is. And I, I think people should be honest because then there's no stigma uh, of having any any kind of uh, diagnosis in, in today's world because people can still make a success even though they would have an ADHD. If you could leave a note to yourself in a high school, uh, what would it say? That's a good question. What would I tell my younger self? Um... I, uh, do you, do you want to hear what I would love to say, or what I actually would say? Both. So, <laughs> what I would <laughs> love to say uh, to to the um, as a like as a parent to a kid, I would love to say that hey, take it easier and read more. Uh, that would be what I would love to say, but. As me, I know that it would, you know, it wouldn't really be uh, something I would react. Uh, but as a me now, to my younger self, I would actually say that, hey, sit down and listen to yourself. So what would happen? What do you think would happen if you would actually hear the advice? Yeah, uh, I I honestly think that if if the younger me could hear hear me well uh, or would be open to listen, uh, he would sit down and and maybe notice how his behavior could be changed, uh, but really understanding. Uh, why he does the things he does. I think that's the most critical, that that it took years uh, for me, that I noticed my that I, I was different, uh, and all, all the people who know me, they know that I was a bit different. Uh, but it was something that at that time, people just felt, uh, for example, in school, that the teachers, all, teachers always felt that, you know, I was the one doing bad things, you know, uh, going to stuck in the school after, after everyone else left, uh, in, instead of someone coming to, hey, and really sit down that, uh, and helping you that, okay, I noticed that you have a bit of struggling, concentrate on the things you're not that interested but I noticed that in the things that you are really interested, you are actually the best in the class. So, so instead of trying to uh, make you fit, I would have hoped that by, by either me understanding uh, what are the strengths I should be concentrating uh, or someone else, maybe that in that case, uh, a teacher. So I, could have found my strengths earlier on. Uh, so, so that's maybe, that's a good question. And, and honestly, finding my strengths more earlier on uh, would have probably made my life different. Would, I, would it make it uh, any better? Don't think so, uh, but, but different. What is your favorite word? My favorite word, that's a good question. Maybe rakas. 
uh, it's, it means uh, a love, a, a dear or loved one uh, in Finnish. And that's, that's a word that it can only be used if you have a true special relationship with a person. And I don't mean uh, that I, I would say to, to my uh, spouse or my kids uh, that only, but, but I, that I could say to my parents, I could say to my friends, I could, say, I could even say to my team members in a certain tone of voice that rakas, uh, so that the other, other person really understand that they are important to me as a person, not to me as a managing director or, or founder or anything, but as a person that you mean the world to me. So uh, rakas, yeah, that would be the word. What is your least favorite word? Good question. I don't really, I don't really have a single word I hate. Uh, but I do, if, if let's say, uh, let's turn it a bit other way around, but I do hate when someone deliberately uses words that uh, the other person listening cannot understand. And, and that's, Any word that is used for raising your importance or superiority uh, against the listener, uh, I think those are uh, my least favorite words. What turns you on creatively, spiritually or emotionally? Maybe that comes back to uh, also to Veen. Uh, as I said to you that that if we felt that something was humoristic uh, and meaningful uh, and something worth doing. So if I find that the thing is humoristic, meaningful and worth doing, I, I definitely get motivated. And that's where, my, where I get my spirits really to uh, that kind of uh, really sharp, uh, razor sharp uh, focus on doing things creatively, uh, living uh, passionately, uh, loving my spouse passionately, so uh, loving my kids passionately. So, so I, I love when there's laughter uh, and we do something, we live our lives that we feel that there's a meaning and, and we do things that we think that are fun and, and worth doing. What turns you off? Simply, this is easy to say, selfish, self-centered and greedy people. Those, that's just, there's no words to that. What is your favorite curse word? Vittu. And I use it quite a lot. What sound or noise do you love? I love, uh, uh, I love, love the sound of wind. In the summertime, sound of wind in birch leaves. What sound or noise do you hate? Sharp noises. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would be happily an artist. An artist. What, what profession would you not like to do? I wouldn't, I wouldn't love to... Uh, This was actually something I said even today in the morning. I wouldn't want to be a legal representative for serious criminals. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any era, which one would you choose? Mm. That, would be, uh, that would be something to do with motorsports or, or motors. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe something to do with uh, the first Formula One uh, companies or or the the companies running uh, the World Rally Championships cars. Uh, yeah, that would be really a dream come true as a as a the small boy that loved rally. Any final words for the audience? Can be funny words, uh, crazy words, or just uh, words of wisdom? 
anyone who's thinking about uh, becoming an entrepreneur, so do it today.